Hey guys, I'm Skip Hollinsworth. I'm a writer for Texas Monthly Magazine, which if you haven't heard of it, is a big generic general interest magazine that runs all over Texas and runs long stories, as long as 10,000 word stories about someone's life in Texas. And it can be everything from the life of a politician to the life of a criminal, which is my specialty. It can be anything from the life of a Houston socialite to a life of the West Texas rancher or a cowboy. And this has been my job writing for this magazine for more than 30 years. And people say, how did you get to this job? And how did you become a nonfiction writer? Which is especially an important question to ask you guys, because y'all have a contest y'all can enter coming up in March, early March is the deadline for the uh, Bush Library Writers Com Contest. And also your essays will be entered into the Mayburn School of Journalism at the University of North Texas, which has a Young Spurs contest for young writers looking for the great young talent. And I'm gonna get to the address, the website for y'all to go to in a moment to send your essays in. But there's this, there, it's very interesting. We talk about how society has turned to TikTok and Twitter and some Instagram and no one wants to write anymore, which just simply isn't true. There's lots of places to become a writer and there's lots of room for, to write. And there's lots of people looking for the next great young writer, someone out of your generation who can be really good, really f facile, really a great storyteller. And so I want to sort of talk about what my life has become, how my life has emerged, the career, and to talk about not only my career, but why I got into it to begin with and to talk about the kind of stories I do. And then we're going to end it. And then I'm going to go to a speech talking about a specific story I've written, a true crime story that's gotten a lot of attention at Texas Monthly. So I grew up in Wichita Falls, which is a lot like Bryan College Station, except for the university. You know, it's, you think it's a very boring life. But I began to do something that's very important if you want to be a writer. I paid attention. I listened to people talk. I listened to the way they talk. I listened to the way my friends talk. And I would sometimes write notes about what my buddy Greg Stewart would say or what Frank Lee said that was funny, that was sort of weird. Because in, t in your teenage years, you have an, a way of looking at the world that never happens again. And if I had kept a definitive notebook, a bigger notebook or kept a Word document on my computer where I wrote down funny things that happened to me during my high school years, that book would be worth gold because it's what publishers, book publishers, movie producers, film directors, HBO executives are all looking for. They don't care about what I'm writing anymore because I'm an old fart to them, but they want the next young thing the next young star, the next young good writer that's going to be able to capture the zeitgeist or the way teenagers live in 2022. So if you are someone who's interested in telling a story, who likes stories, who likes the way, who likes to sort of regale people, friends on Friday nights with stories about what's going on in your life, then you have all the markings of a writer. And a writer can have a fantastic life. You know, they can live wherever they want. They don't have to go to an office. They can write whatever they want to write about. They have comic book, book and movie contracts that pay them a lot of money. That's the kind of life that you can have. And at the same time, you can re write rewarding stories about what you're doing with yourself or what people are doing. I grew up sort of watching people act, watching people do their lives. My father was a minister, so I would sometimes sneak, people would come over to talk to him and I would sneak down the hallway and listen to these people describe their sins that they had committed. And I would go in, this is a heck of a story. And I began to realize that my joy in life was following these characters, was following characters around and writing stories down about them. Now there's two sort of ways to go in writing. There's nonfiction, which is what I do, which is what you, where you tell, you use facts to tell your story. And then of course there's fiction, which is what I tried, which is 
sort of in some ways harder because you've got to, you know, re rely upon purely your imagination and you have to be able to write beautiful sentences. So I sort of turned to journalism as I went to college and I wrote, went to college at TCU in Fort Worth and I spent all my time write, take, taking writing classes. I wrote, took classes in English and journalism. I took a business writing class. I took poetry writing classes, essay writing classes, because I knew I wanted to be a writer, but I also knew that I was lazy, that I liked to socialize, and that I wasn't going to sit down and write on my own unless someone forced me to do it, which meant going to taking classes that forced me to turn things in every week. So I worked at the Daily Skiff, which is the college newspaper. And I just wrote little stories about the meetings of the college council or the TCU football team winning or losing a game. I would write little essays about things going on in college. I would interview professors. And I began to fall in love with the way life worked. But I also began to develop a kind of weird love for true crime. And true crime is a huge burgeoning industry. And at this point in my career, I've written a podcast called Tom Brown's Body about a uh, teenage boy in the panhandle who disappeared and almost everyone in the town, the little town out in the panhandle, became a suspect in his death. But the first story, after I graduated from college, I went to work for newspapers. And here's in many ways how I learned to write. A lot of, a lot of y'all will think that writing is an art. But actually, it's a craft. It's like building a house. You learn how to do it from by reading the masters about how to sort of craft the house, where to hammer in the nails. And then you have your story, construct, your house constructed, or in our case, the story constructed. I would imitate other writers. And one of the old ways of teaching writing was that they would have you open up a chapter of Hemingway and type in the chapter to understand how Hemingway wrote his sentences so cleanly and you got a sense of learning what Hemingway's writing was like, and then you could imitate that in your own writing. So I imitated Hemingway, Faulkner, John Irving, all kinds of people in college. I would see how they would do sentences and paragraphs, and then I would imitate it myself. So I wrote a story. I, would, I looked also for dramatic stories because I knew there's a difference between stories and articles. You know, you hear to, these days a lot of people talk about content, that they need good content. I hate the word content. I hate the word article. I want, I want to read a story, and people are hungering to read stories. That's why this is a profession that has got so much possibility. People hunger to read good stories, stories with, that are dramatic, with a beginning, a middle, and end, stories that can be very funny, stories that can be very tragic, stories that can be mysteries, stories that can be sort of inside looks at a certain part of society. You know, I, in, I graduated from college and went to work for a local newspaper in Dallas. And that's what I did. I sat, sat on the city desk and wrote daily stories about what was going on. There was a man that was walking backwards across the United States and he came through Dallas. I went out and interviewed him. I mean, totally ridiculous, but it was a way of capturing his personality in a way of capturing the personality of people you come across. And I began to, you know, write other stories about the oldest man in Dallas who had the oldest farm in Dallas and how he was trying to keep the crops growing, even though he knew he was dying, which took on this bittersweet, tragic pose. And then I hear this about this man in South Dallas who was this Renaissance, handsome, piano playing, poetry reading, all around Renaissance man who would sneak out at night, pick up prostitutes in this low income area of South Dallas, shoot them in the back of the head, and then take an X-Acto blade and cut out their eyeballs with such precision that when he shut the eyelids, no one could tell the eyeballs were missing. And he finally got arrested after killing like five or six women. And this hunt to find him was a, sort of a manhunt all, all over Dallas. And I went and covered his trial and he was convicted barely on, you know, some flimsy evidence, but he got convicted. And I wrote him a note and sent it to the county jail. And I said, I'd like to hear, I'd like to talk about this. I know you think, I know you, 
insists that you've got railroaded at trial, and I'd like to find out what you think. And I'd never done anything like this before, written a, a criminal, a, a serial killer, a mass murderer, a vicious kind of Dallas version of Jack the Ripper. And he sent me a letter back from jail, and then I had given him my phone number, and he called me collect. And he said, come talk to me. And I began to take, pay these visits to him day after day after day and began to talk to him about his life and slowly realized that he was unspooling some kind of crazy, psychotic part of his personality to me, which led me to write my first big true crime story. It's been optioned several times for a movie. It's called See No Evil. It ran 30 years ago, 20 years ago. I'm now 64. I started working at Texas Monthly when I was in my early 30s after working for the newspapers and other magazines and freelancing. I got all this attention for writing a story about a killer. And it was my first sort of story as a true crime author. And I said, well, the attention I got for that and the enjoyment I felt out of being able to watch someone who had stepped across the line from normal behavior to something so completely bewildering and insane that it was captivating. So I looked for another story like that. I found a woman who had been robbing banks in Dallas for years, dressing up as a cowboy, looking just like a man. And so the FBI, when they would look at videotape of this car, of this person getting out of a car, kept thinking they were dealing with some old rural rustic cowboy from the rural part of the state. And I tracked her down and got after she got arrested and persuaded her to do an interview. I interviewed a young teenage boy who became a sort of world-class jewel thief. And his girlfriend was his getaway driver and how they got away with robbing some of the richest homes in Dallas as, as jewel thieves that they were, they were as good as European cat burglars. What else did I write? I wrote, in the meantime, I would write personal essays, like which you could write coming up in next month for your, uh, in March for your contest. I wrote essays about growing up in Wichita Falls. I used to go out to the State Lunatic Asylum in Wichita Falls and watch and volunteer there because I was fascinated by these crazy people. These people who took this step from sanity to insanity and what took what happened that caused them to act like that. I wrote about playing in my high school orchestra. These are kind of memory, you know, essays of memory that I made them funny. I was never a good writer. This is, even though I've won a lot of awards and had articles turned into movies and books, I've never been a good writer. And I want y'all to hear this closely. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room or the best stylist or the one with the biggest vocabulary to be the most successful writer. What you have to do is have the ability to tell a story. And what I was able to do, I mean, I worked at a magazine that was full of A-list, world-class, good writers. And what I did was I said, the only way to compete and stay in the same game with these top writers is to be a good reporter, is to get good details for the stories I was writing, which meant calling people up and asking real specific questions, like, what were you wearing the day the robbery took place? How many gunshots were fired? And you build your story by the detail that I that you pick up. So that's the kind of writing I was. I was not Shakespeare by any stretch of the imagination. I wrote real clean, simple sentences, and I looked for a story to tell, a story with an arc, a beginning, middle, and end. And true crime stories are sort of naturally built that way. Someone's murdered, the police investigate, can't find them. Finally, there's a break in the case. The murderer's revealed. Why did he do it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see how the story arcs. There is no such thing, and, and try to remember this too, there's really no such thing as a natural writer. I cannot tell you how many times I've been approached by aspiring writers who have asked me to tell them whether their pages show promise. Well, you can't really, all good pages, all pages show some promise. But having natural ability doesn't mean that you're going to be a successful writer. You have to do the work. You have to write stories. You have to learn how to build the house. You have to work with the, you have to be a craftsman, learning where to put the nails in. What should be your introduction? 
what should be your follow-up paragraphs and making sure that you understand the character you're writing about. If you write an essay about your life, about your past, which I encourage you to do, you need to be real honest about what happened and you need to like go interview people and say, do you remember the day that we all got arrested for busting into the bowling alley back in junior high school? I'm writing an essay about that. Do you remember what happened? You have to do the leg work, the shoe leather work to try to get details down. But that's what's part of the fun of nonfiction is that you get to do that kind of thing. You get to be a reporter, which requires a lot of skills that a lot of people don't necessarily have. You have to show an endless curiosity. You have to be able to be, you know, one of the things I do when I go interview somebody is who sort of looks at me dubiously, like, why is this reporter here? I'll say, I just want help in understanding why this happened, whatever event or crime was that we're talking about. So is there anything you can do to let me in on what ex exactly happened and why? And you'll discover that people love to tell stories about themselves. And they love to talk about themselves, even if you're a teenager. And some people will start telling you stories. And it's a really rewarding experience because you're getting facts that you can use to write your essay. I'm gonna give you some pieces of advice as to how to be a better writer, which I wish I had been told in high school. Number one, I've mentioned this before, but it's worth reiterating, keep a notebook. Write down things that you see that are funny. As teenagers, y'all have an ability to use language in ways that 65 year old people like me do not have anymore. You have this creative talent. You're young, you know, you're willing to try a lot of stuff. You don't have to write with the usual punctuation. I know that sometimes you write essays in English class that you think are totally boring, but for the essay contest that y'all have a chance to enter, you can write any way you want to. You can use any kind of style you want. And the more innovative and the more creative, the better. So, you know, what I tend to do is I keep a document on my computer that says basically notes, notes. And then I call, you know, I click on notes. And if someone has said something funny during the day, I type it in because you'll forget. As smart as you think you are right now, as you get older, though, you'll one day just say what I said, I wish I kept a notebook about my teenage years because I could have turned that into a best-selling book or a screenplay. And there are people, by the way, that are looking for good screenplays. You know, these six part series that run on Netflix about teenage life, they're just hungry to find another one. And they look for stories like that with great adolescent drama, teenage teenage stories so the other thing is you'll say well yes i want to write one of those but how do i pick something well first of all if there's something that's happened in your own life that you think is interesting or dramatic use that change the names but use that because write what you know is a big big theory is a big big statement that everybody learns early it's easier to write about something you know, to write about something that happened in your life in Bryan or in College Station that's much more interesting than, and will sound much more realistic than writing about, you know, someone in a, going to Mars in a new, newfangled spaceship. But having said that, science fiction is a huge, huge source of writing these days. And there's producers and book publishers that are and editors that look for good science fiction. So I'm going to give you some things about what to do if you're thinking about writing a, an essay or a story and you're not sure what it should be about. Okay. Number one, what is a novel, a movie or a book about teenage life that has most affected you? And if it is, if so, is it something that can be imitated? Number two, what is a book, fiction or nonfiction, novel or memoir or a work of journalism that you would write right now if someone said to you, you have to go to school, but you're not taking any classes, you have to sit down and write for the next eight hours for the school day for the next week, what would that story be if you had one free week at school to just do nothing but write? What is the story you would write? And three... The essence of good writing is good rewriting. Do not be afraid to write a terrible first draft. Hemingway used to say that all first drafts are crap, and they are. 
because it's hard. To, writing is a hard thing to do. So don't do what I tend to do to, to this day, which is write a sentence and it's not perfect. And I keep working on that sentence and suddenly the day is over. You write a bad first draft and it's going to be full of clunkers. It's going to be full of dull sentences. It's going to be full of stupid remarks, but you've got something on the page or on your computer that you can then begin to reshape and you write a second draft and then you write a third draft. So rewrite because every, nothing you write in your first draft is any good. And remember, this is a craft. It's not an art. None of us are going to be these Nobel Prize winners that write artistic novels that uh, are reviewed on the front page of the New York Times Book Review. What we're writing here are essays that are fun, that are interesting, that are sad. So this is your chance to give it a shot in entering the Mayburn S Essay Contest. Go to bush41.org, the website, or bush41.org slash education, and you'll see the rules for an essay that you can turn in. And I encourage you to give it a shot. You know, you can write something about your parents, pro or con. You can write something about your early years in school, in elementary school. You can write something about the feelings you've had about some event. And you can turn it in at bush41.org slash education, and it'll be entered in, that, in the local contest, the Region 6 contest, and it'll also be entered into the, the Mayburn Literary Contest that happens every summer up at UNT. And there's a chance you could win that and win some scholarship money and get noticed. And you could come up to the Mayburn School's journalism conference and be taught one-on-one -on -one by professional writers. I've done it for years with young writers. It's a rewarding thing to do because you see such talent in you guys. Okay. I'm now going to tell you a story about a story I wrote and how I got a hold of that story. It's a true crime story. It's totally entertaining. It's uh, funny. And it's about the teenagers that became the jewel thieves. So I'm going to, through the magic of the internet, change clothes and tell you that story. Thank you guys for listening. Hi, everybody. I'm Skip Hollinsworth, a writer at Texas Monthly Magazine. And I'm here to tell you a story that you will probably find completely unbelievable, but every word is true, totally true. I'm a journalist. I write stories about things that go on in Texas, especially Texas crime. And I'm always fascinated when I see little things that might suggest a larger story. So a few years back, I saw this advertisement in the taken out in the metro section of the Dallas Morning News, the newspaper. And it said $25,000 reward for stolen jewelry. And I thought, $25,000? And there were pictures that were in the ad. And those pictures were beautiful gemstones, diamonds, rubies. I don't know much about jewelry, but this was some nice ice, some really nice ice. So there's a phone number at the bottom. Being the nosy guy that I am, I called it. And it was answered by a private investigator's company. And a man named Michael Miles got on the phone, who's a former FBI agent, well-known in Dallas, longtime FBI agent, who works for wealthy people in Dallas. And I said, can you tell me something about this ad that you took out? Was there a jewelry heist? And he says, there's nothing I can tell you, sir. There's absolutely nothing you need to know. This is a private matter. But we've taken out ads all over the world in jewelry catalogs in Paris and in London looking for the stolen jewels of a very prominent Dallas family. But that's all I can say. That's absolutely all I can say. Well, I started sniffing around, of course. Journalists sniff around when they're not told the complete truth. And I talked to the society editor of the Dallas Morning News. And he goes, well, what I've heard is that a robbery took place on Deloach Avenue at a massive mansion owned by the Simmons family. And I went, a mansion on Deloach Avenue, the Simmons family, that was one of the most famous houses in Dallas, 12,000 square feet. It had state-of-the-art alarm systems. In fact, with the dishwasher, if the glasses rattled, the alarm would go off. That's how sensitive the burglar alarms were. There was a uh, DPS, Department of Public Safety, off-duty officer that worked in the, in the house or out in the driveway 24 hours a day to guard the property. 
and he was required to take walks around the perimeter of the property twice a day. There was a guard dog named Titus. It was impenetrable. A 12-foot stone wall surrounded the mansion estate. Someone had gotten into the Simmons mansion. Harold Simmons was a major billionaire in Dallas. And I said uh, to the society editor of the Dallas Morning News, I said, are you sure it's the Simmons estate? And he goes, that's what I heard. So I began to do some more digging. And I went down to the police department. Back then, you couldn't log on to get police reports on computers. And I started digging through the cop records and saw the report that a burglary had occurred on Delote Street at the home of Harold and Annette Simmons. It was true. And then I heard by reading the police reports that the lead burglary detective in the entire Dallas Police Department, a crusty veteran named Joe Philpot, here's his photo, who had been working jewelry heist in Dallas for years, had been assigned to the case. And he seemed to be doing a nationwide search for the jewels himself. Besides the private investigator whom Annette Simmons had hired, the wife had hired to find the jewels, the Dallas Police Department had its top investigator on the case. And he was looking at jewel thieves who were renowned in as far away as Los Angeles and New York to see if maybe they'd come through Dallas and gone after Annette's jewelry. Because Annette Simmons was famous in Dallas for her jewelry. She bought jewelry like the rest of us buy fast food. She's just obsessed with jewelry. She reads jewelry catalogs the way I read Sports Illustrated magazine. She loves buying jewelry. She had 200 pieces in her house. And that didn't even include her largest gemstones, which were in a safety deposit box at a bank. And she had a uh, safe with full of jewelry. And she had a lot of jewelry in, just on her bathroom counter. Lots of jewelry. She's crazy for jewelry. And she's the classic Dallas socialite, obsessed with that kind of world and that kind of life. And someone had avoided the DPS guards, jumped the wall avoided the guard dog, beat the security system, and got into her master bathroom and beat the motion detector that was in that was up and down the hallway and grabbed her jewels that were in the bathroom counter and took off. It was the largest jewelry heist in Dallas at that time, where two million dollars of jewels were stolen, and no one had a clue. No one had a clue who did it. Well, months passed. Joe Philpot was still on the case, and Annette was still hiring the private investigator, the ex-FBI agent, to take out jewelry ads and look around the world to see if her jewels had been chopped up and sold somewhere. And then I see another little story in the Dallas Morning News, and it said, young couple arrested for robbery on Deloach. Well, I headed back, I didn't say anything, and I headed back downtown to get the next police report. And there was the police report that two young people, a man named Mitch Shaw, there you see him, and a young big haired woman named Jennifer Dolan, you see her there, had been arrested for pulling off what was the kind of jewelry heist that no one could have imagined. It was the greatest jewelry heist in Dallas history. And it was done by what looked like two young teenagers. Most robberies are called smash and grabs. That's what the police call them. A robber gets in, grabs what he can in just a few seconds before the burglar alarms hit and gets out of there as fast as possible. The average take of a burglary, even of a wealthy mansion, is about $3,000. But this was a robbery that went not only for $2 million, but the kind of robbery that would daunt even the most veteran cat burglar in Europe. How did this young couple pull off the heist of the century in Dallas, who, and of course, I was completely obsessed and I began to do some research. So Mitch Shaw grew up in Dallas. His grandfather was a judge. His father worked at the comptroller's office for the state government in Texas. His father married a pretty young woman named Melanie, but they, and they had Mitch, but they didn't get along and soon divorced. And she moved to Houston without Mitch. And Mitch lived with his dad in a little neighborhood in Dallas. And his dad remarried a school teacher. Everything seemed fine. And then his dad had a 
brain tumor and died. And Mitch found himself in junior high school living with this stepmother whom he barely knew. And he was this quiet kid. He rarely spoke in school. He didn't join clubs. He didn't climb trees. He wasn't an athlete. He liked to swim. Keep that detail in mind for later. But he was not personable. He was sort of a wallflower in school. Most people had no idea who he was. And he didn't seem to have much personality. He liked to work on a computer and, and, and write computer code. He sometimes painted abstract paintings. He loved, a cat. he loved cats that were in the house. And as I said, he loved to swim. Well, he did have one act of early teenage rebellion. He stole a camera out of a neighbor's car, but he wasn't a very smart thief. He went, took it to a pawn shop and wrote down his real name and address on the pawn shop slip. And the police were easily able to track him down and arrest him. But there was one person who did interest him a lot. Her name was Jennifer Dolan. Jennifer was this Barbie doll, big haired, big makeup, lots of lipstick kind of teenage girl, wore short dresses, high heels that clicked up and down the school hallways. She dated football players, guys that rode motorcycles. Mitch was exactly the kind of guy she would never even look at twice. But Mitch became obsessed with her and he began to try to figure out how to win her over. Now, this part, a lot of people think I'm making up, but it's completely true. A few blocks from where Mitch lived was a man named Gerald Todd. And Gerald was a well-known, notorious fence in, in Dallas. A fence is a man or a woman who takes stolen goods, buys them for pennies on the dollar from a thief, and then resells them. Thieves love to have a good fence because they like stealing things, but they don't necessarily like the process of trying to sell it to make money off of it. So all thieves need a good fence. What people don't know is that all fences need a good thief. And Mitch showed up at this man's door one day and said, I hear you can teach me how to be a jewel thief. And the man just stared at Mitch, who was scrawny, had no muscles in his arms. He looked sort of dour and pathetic and pitiful and didn't seem to have much drive or charisma whatsoever. And Gerald said, well, if you want to learn, here we go. And so Mitch learned at what Gerald called starter homes, how to get through plate glass windows, how to beat little small security systems, how to look for jewelry real fast and to get out. And he found that Mitch was a kind of savant at this, that Mitch loved stealing jewels and Mitch was really good at getting them and getting out without being caught and making his way out. He had a kind of knack for it. So Gerald moved him up to another, to another set of homes in the Bentry neighborhood of Dallas, which was a wealthier North Dallas place where there were green belts in the back. And Mitch became a success breaking in and stealing jewels there. And what Gerald learned was that Mitch was so patient a thief that he could beat motion detectors, which are the real problems for thieves trying to get into homes. He was able to walk so slowly down a hallway, didn't trick the motion detector at all. And he was also, to get into the house, he would take a screwdriver and a hammer and he would hammer out a hole very patiently, just big enough for him to crawl through. And then he would walk down the hallway so quietly. And this, of course, is while the owners are gone. And so slowly that it didn't trick the alarm system at all. And then he would rifle through the master bathroom and look for things. And of course, the master bathrooms don't have alarm systems or motion detectors because the occupants of the house tend to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and they don't want to turn off the alarms. So Mitch began to make some serious pops and Gerald decided to move him up to the big neighborhood, the big rich mansion filled neighborhoods that, that are on estates in North Dallas. If you're ever in Dallas at like Northwest Highway in Preston, if you go north of there, you'll see these giant estates. And that's where the richest people in Dallas live. And he was hitting doctors, plastic surgeons, lawyers, big money. And he would go, you know, once every two or three months and no one caught him. 
And the reason no one caught him was he had a good wheel man. Now, for those of you who don't know criminal terminology, and I hope that's all of you, the wheel man in Jewel Heist is the getaway driver. And usually the getaway driver is another male who can drive, who has a hot souped up car and can tear out as soon as the, the actual thief gets back to the car with the loot and they take off. Well, no one in Gerald Todd's organization wanted to work with Mitch because they thought he was sort of a nerd and sort of dopey and didn't seem to be very physically tough. And they thought he would just be a failure. And Mitch didn't care anyway because he wanted his own wheel man. He went to Jennifer and chose her, asked her to be his wheel man. He'd been trying to flirt with Jennifer all that time. And Mitch had been trying to win her over. And it was going to no way fast. He was totally unsuccessful. And so what he did was he came up with this plan, which is why he approached Gerald Todd in the begin with. He came up with this plan to turn himself like Walter Mitty in that famous James Thurber short story, turn himself into this romantic, heroic, Cary Grant-like figure from, from a movie where he's the dashing, daring jewel thief. And he would give Jen, he would take Jennifer to lunch and give her jewels. And Jennifer was very impressed. And she was really impressed when he said, I, will you be my will man? And Jennifer, who had more daring than Mitch, said, of course I will. And they became this couple. And Mitch would hit the houses and Jennifer would be waiting for him at a drop at a meeting up point, and off they'd go. Well, time passed. Mitch had a few close calls, but he always got away. At one point, he was in someone's master bathroom, rifling through the bathroom looking for jewels when he heard sirens going off and he realized he had somehow tripped the, the alarm. He ran out through the hole in the window with the jewels in his hand. He jumped the fence. He took off his pants. He hid the jewels underneath the pants, underneath the tree, and jumped in the neighbor's swimming pool and began swimming laps back and forth, back and forth. And so when all these cops arrived, they didn't even look twice at the next door neighbor swimming in his own pool. And that's what got Mitch out of that jam pretty quickly. Another time he got he tripped the silent alarm and he heard the sirens coming and he threw off his clothes real fast and put on the owner's tennis togs that he saw in the closet, grabbed a tennis racket and ran out the front door and jogged down the street as the police cars were coming the other way to find the burglar. He was a genius. And the word began to get around that there was a genius jewel thief working Dallas and there was no way to catch him. So that's why they started a task force and with full of detectives, including Joe Philpott as the lead detective, and still couldn't find him. And then comes the big heist of all time. He broke into the mansion. And then with all these cops looking for him, Mitch still went after the biggest heist of all, the mansion owned by the Simmons. And he got away with it. It was just simply unfathomable to the cops that someone could have beaten the Simmons system completely. Well, more time passed, and I figured I didn't have a story to write because you want to have an ending, and no one was going to catch him, and I just sort of waited, took notes, and waited, and I wasn't the only one who read the newspaper and saw that ad in the Dallas Morning News about stolen jewelry and the $25,000 reward. A man who worked in a poor neighborhood in Dallas as a chicken delivery driver, he delivered chicken to people in their apartments named One-Eyed Jack because he lost one eye long ago during a fight. He was an avid reader too, despite having just one eye. And he read that advertisement and he called the same number and he to spoke to the private investigator, the former FBI agent, and he said, there's a woman that comes into the neighborhood periodically who trades jewels for crack cocaine. She was addicted to having a little bit of crack cocaine and she wanted to trade jewels for drugs. Well, the detective who had no leads whatsoever called Joe Philpot, the Dallas Police Department. He had no leads. So he set up in this area where the one-eyed Jack, the chicken man delivery truck driver worked and waited. 
And they just, he and the cops just waited night after night after night until this turquoise colored Toyota Tercel pulled up and out popped Jennifer Dolan with some jewels that had been stolen from the Simmons mansion. And she traded them for a couple of bags of crack cocaine. As soon as she made the trade with the one on Jack, the cops rushed in and arrested her, took her downtown, interrogated her. She wouldn't give Mitch up. They finally got enough out to find out where she lived and realized Mitch lived there too and figured that Mitch was the jewel thief and she was his accomplice. And so they arrested him. So they went to trial and Jennifer was going to be forced to testify against Mitch because if she didn't, the district attorney was going to throw the book at her. So Mitch comes out in a tie, looking thin and dour and unhappy and muscleless, the last man you expect to be a jewel thief. And Jennifer took the stand to testify against him, sort of gave half testimony and didn't tell the full truth and just sort of said she didn't know what was going on. The district attorney was furious, but what could he do? The defense attorney for Mitch attempted to say that the jewels that they said were Annette Simmons that Jennifer had were actually fakes. And that turned out to be untrue. So the jury went into the jury room to render a verdict and they came back out. And Mitch, you have to realize, had never before committed a crime, been arrested for anything except that juvenile arrest. He was, he looked like he was just this young man making a search for himself. And the jury sort of liked him. And they gave him 10 years probation and sent him on his way. And Mitch walked out the door. Well, Jennifer tried to straighten up. Mitch and Jennifer went their separate ways. Mitch got a job with a moving company. Jennifer got a job with a restaurant in McKinney, Texas. They didn't seem to be communicating whatsoever. Jennifer tried to get sober get off drugs. She dated a cop for a while. Mitch seemed to be getting rid of his thieving instincts. The story seemed over. But then the police, Joe Philpot, the police detective, was so upset that Mitch did not have to serve any time for doing all these jewel heists that he went through the property room of the Dallas Police Department and looked for evidence that Mitch had been doing other crimes. And he found this case of a North Dallas mansion that had a little blood on the window that where someone had scraped himself getting through the broken window. They ran a DNA test on the blood and they tried to match it with Mitch's blood and it matched. And suddenly he had a second case against Mitch. Well, they worked out a deal where Mitch would get a five-year sentence if he would tell the cops every place he robbed. And so he got in a van one day and went from house to house and told them who he robbed and how much he took and whether Jennifer was the wheel man or not. He even drove past his own defense attorney's house and said he robbed his own defense attorney because he got mad at him one day before the trial began. And the case seemed to be done. Mitch went off to prison. Jennifer was sobering up still with her cop. But Mitch got off for good time served, and in three years, he was out. And here's where it gets tricky. Mitch completely disappeared, as did Jennifer. And to this day, Joe Philpot, the Dallas police detective, has yet to retire, even though he's in his late 60s, because he knows that Mitch and Jennifer are still out robbing houses and getting jewels, and they could be anywhere in the country, And he studies crimes from Alaska to New York to Florida to see if he can figure out where the two of them are. So far, he hasn't. But kids, if you've got jewels at your house, make sure you lock doors at night and turn on your alarm systems because Mitch and Jennifer are still out there. I hope you enjoyed this talk. It's not your traditional school talk, but it's a lot of fun to think about these two kids. Good luck to you. Thanks.